sou Raiza Rua e sou pesquisadora do Laboratório de Estudos Interdisciplinares Crítica e Capitalismo, o LEIC UERJ, um laboratório atrelado à Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, à Faculdade de Direito e o Programa de Pós-Graduação em Direito da Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Estou aqui para fazer um convite para convidá-los a assistir esse vídeo e os próximos vídeos que vamos lançar com o professor Kevin B. Anderson, nosso parceiro, autor de Marx nas Margens. É um vídeo sobre os trabalhos tardios de Marx, sobre raça, etnia, nacionalismo e sociedades não europeias. A gente está fazendo isso porque a gente tinha uma agenda marcada marcada com o professor Kevin Anderson para trazê-lo ao Brasil, para o lançamento do seu livro, uma agenda que era para ter acontecido em maio. Essa agenda foi cancelada por causa da crise e da pandemia da Covid. A gente tentou disponibilizar, compartilhar com vocês o que a gente tinha é, gravado do professor Kevin Anderson, intervenções, é, reuniões que a gente já fez com ele. E a gente espera que isso sirva pra, como início de um debate sobre Marx, o marxismo, o racismo, o antirracismo e o colonialismo, porque a gente entende que é mais do que necessário, importante também para a crítica do direito e do Estado, a nós nos apropriarmos desses debates. Esse vídeo, então, portanto, vai ser o primeiro vídeo de uma série de quatro vídeos é, que trata do assunto e a gente convida você para assistir, para curtir, para curtir o nosso canal. É, a, nós somos novos nas redes sociais, né? O nosso núcleo é um núcleo muito ligado à universidade, à militância, a usar o conhecimento prático, fazer a crítica do direito, a crítica da sociologia jurídica. Então, é isso. Chamo vocês para assistir. Sejam bem-vindos bem ao nosso canal. Curtam. É, o nosso vídeo e sigam a gente nas redes sociais, no nosso site. Toda a nossa produção acadêmica está disponibilizada no nosso site, www.leikwerd.com. Então, vem com a gente e vamos debater Marx, marxismo, antirracista, anticolonialista, antissexista. Vem com a gente. <música> Second thing I want to say is, uh, well, is to just introduce a few of the themes of Marx at the margins, as I see it. But as the as a lot of people, including the postmodernists, tell us, uh, the reader writes as much as as the author. And so, you write a book and you think this is what's important, but then other people tell you, but after about ten years, you figure out what is important. So what I'm saying now is. It's not that it's not what I would have said 10 years ago when the book was first published in English, but kind of probably some influence of all the readers over the past 10 years. So I have four uh, themes I want to mention. First of all, I think the most obvious one, and this is the way the book started out, kind of anger at these people like Edward Said, who call Marx Eurocentric and all this kind of thing. And so I wanted to answer them. I wanted to show that Marx was actually an anti-colonialist, uh, was anti-imperialist, that he took very seriously the social structures and, and social uh, dynamics of societies outside Western Europe, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. As I wrote the book, I discovered that actually Edward Said was partially correct in the sense that there are some early writings, there's some sentences in the Communist Manifesto, there's writings on India in 1853, where Marx does seem to support colonialism as progressive. I mean, he's always, I mean, they're obviously doing it for profit and with brutality, but he's kind of saying that in balance, it's positive to go in and shake up these old social structures that are very traditional. And of course, lots of people like to quote this, uh, not just Edward Said, but lots of liberals like to quote quote this as a criticism of Marx. What I show in the book is that every single one of those things that are problematic in the 1840s and 50s disappear. Uh, they start to disappear by the late 1850s. By the end of his life, they're, all, they're just about completely gone. Uh, so Marx, as a kind of anti-colonialist, but different from Lenin, uh, or with the great book on imperialism that I mentioned before, Lenin didn't talk very much. Lenin talked about the global financial structures of imperialism. Marx doesn't talk very much about that, but what he but he does detailed study of the social structures of the societies that are being colonized. 
So toward the end of his life, in the last two or three years, he probably wrote, and this is, most of this is research, it's research notes rather than a manuscript for a book. It's, it wasn't yet at that stage, but he wrote about 100,000 words on, on India. Uh, the village structure, the history of India, the, the, this kind of thing. Uh, so Marx is a thinker who's interested in colonialism, anti-colonialism, also indigenous peoples. He was interested very much in uh, those parts of the non-European world, uh, some of which survived into his own time, uh, these very simple societies technologically where there was a form of communism already existing. And the most communistic of all these communistic societies that he talks about at the end of his life, one of them is uh, in, in uh, the, the Great Plains of the United States, the Lakotas, and the other one is the Botocudos, Botocudos in Brazil. And both of these societies have almost no property, not even like personal property. Most of that, when they die, that, that, gets, that doesn't get inherited by their children or something like that, but it's considered, they're basically just using it, but they don't actually own it. The, the clan or tribe owns it. Okay, so that's one set of, and of course, at the very end of his life, he suggests that this, what he called primitive communism, uh, which he sees as still existing in the villages and places like Russia and India. But in the case of Russia, he actually says that this could be a point of communist resistance to capitalism if it links up to the Western proletariat. So, he, so uh, he's very interested in not just as a sociological issue, but as a political and uh, as a political subject that could resist uh, the global systems. Okay, secondly, uh, in a sense, the book is two books because the other part of it is talking about race and oppressed minorities uh, inside societies, inside existing capitalist societies. And the two examples of that he spends the most time on are the blacks, blacks in America and the Irish in Britain. And you have to realize that in the late 19th century, at the time he's writing, the Irish were not considered to be white. If you look at the, the stereotypes in the uh, cartoons and magazines like Punch, the Irish are presented as ape-like. They use the same analogy to apes and gorillas with the Irish that they use to blacks. Obviously it's not as intense, it wasn't as long lasting, but uh, there, there, there are a lot of similarities. So one of the things that he gets involved in from very early on is opposition to slavery. He writes for the New York Tribune, which is a capitalist newspaper, but it's a very deeply anti-slavery newspaper. It's kind of the left wing, it's a left wing bourgeois newspaper, if you will. There's an article in the Tribune that I sell, that I uh, quote in the book where he, uh, from 1858, I think it is, where it celebrates armed resistance by basically an armed mob that frees a slave and takes him back to their town and says they're gonna protect him. Uh, the slave would escape from uh, the South. So the Tribune is a, so he's very, just the fact that he's writing for them uh, is an aspect of his anti-slavery commitment. And then we can see it from very early on, even before the Communist Manifesto, when he attacks Proudhon in uh, The Poverty of Philosophy, he has this wonderful paragraph where he says that without slavery, we wouldn't have capitalism. Uh, that, that, that the whole uh, slave uh, plantations and so on is a huge part of just the structure of, of, of capitalism. Uh, when the Civil War in the United States comes along in 1861, Marx regards this as the most important revolutionary event since the French Revolution. And uh, he's very firmly in support of the Northern anti-slavery cause. He's very interested in slave uprisings, uh, the, the possibility that he's very interested in black troops becoming part of the war effort. Toward the end of the war, there were I think 400,000 black troops in the state of Mississippi, which is the most racist state historically in the United States. Uh, that was the one that was the last uh, to open up to any kind of civil rights protections in the 1960s. In the Civil War, during that period, Mississippi was actually majority black. 
And it's been pointed out by historians that, more, and there were some whites that didn't go along with the slavery either, some of the poorer whites. So if you add up all those people, Mississippi is a state where probably per capita you can find more Confederate flags flying than anywhere else in the United States. Mississippi actually had more people fighting on the side of the North than the side of the South, if you add up the blacks and the poor whites. Morris is very interested in slave revolts, but he's also interested in the possibility of the poor whites and the black slaves, former slaves and other blacks getting together uh, in a class-based movement. He thinks the Civil War is very important because until the Civil War, you had basically two working classes. You had one that was enslaved and another a subject to wage labor. And he had this great hope that after the Civil War, it would open up the possibility <clears throat> of radical change. Some things did happen. For example, the United States got the eight hour day for federal government workers way ahead of any other country in that period. There's a number of other social reforms that happened, but ultimately it was unsuccessful uh, to a great extent, a counter of revolution uh, came in. With the Irish, uh, he, all, he, taught, he also talked about, uh, and that's very interesting because with the Irish issue, you have both the colonial and the uh, issue of an oppressed minority operating because the Irish form a minority inside the British working class. They're, the, they're, the, they're a subproletariat. Uh, their, their wages are lower. They, the English workers accuse them of, of lowering their standard of living and all this kind of thing. Then you have Ireland, which is a colonized country initially under feudalism, but by, by, but by Marx's time, a modern capitalist colonialism that's destroying the base of land, at all, land tenure and so forth in Ireland, creating a famine uh, and all these kinds of things like that. So Marx is very interested in uh, not just the oppression of the Irish, but he's interested in how anti-Irish prejudice not only blocks solidarity between Irish and English workers, but the English workers consider them, their prejudice against the Irish, which he compares explicitly to white racism in, in America. He says this drives the uh, English workers into the arms of the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy. Uh, and it operates as a conser conservatizing force. At the same time though, because he's a dialectical thinker, he believes that uh, an uprising in Ireland could be the spark that shakes up Britain, that, that uh, by the 1860s and 70s, he no longer thinks that the British workers on their own are going to uh, change their circumstances. He thinks the additive of Ireland and this uh, national revolution going on there and how that might impact the Irish minority inside Britain and how that might in turn impact the British working class. Uh, be, becomes the dynamic. So it's very similar to that thing with Russia I mentioned. The Russian village and resistance to encroachments of capitalism could become, as he calls it, the starting point, the Ausgangspunkt uh, for a wider socialist revolution across Europe. And so with, and, and with the Irish, a wider revolution, and actually he brings in France there too. So France, Britain, and Ireland, some kind of wider revolutionary uh, uprising. Okay, a third thing, uh, oh yeah, a third aspect would, would be gender under that. Uh, a lot of these notes he takes toward the end of his life are about gender. He, 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 he uh, discovers that a lot of these indigenous societies have greater uh, gender equality. And if you go back further into, uh, into history and prehistory, you find this uh, also the case in a, uh, places like Greece and Rome. Engels certainly writes about this, I'll come to that later. But one thing that happens in his last years that I didn't mention in the book, but I'm mentioning it quite a bit in this book I'm working on now, is that he singles out the participation of women in the Paris Commune of 1871. He makes a big point of that. So there's all these other writings about women during this period that are in his notes and we don't know what he would have done with that because there's no publication that results. When he mentions the Russian village and its communistic resistance, he doesn't mention women there, but he's talking a lot about women when he writes about indigenous groups in the Americas 
and also to uh, in ancient Greece and Rome. So he obviously he must have some concern with that. I can't believe he was doing it just for all uh, research purposes. There must be a wider concern. Okay, the, the third large point I want to talk about briefly is the dialectic. Now, the dialectic means a lot of things to a lot of people, uh, and I can go into more of this later, but uh, the dialectic tradition I come out of uh, is not just about totality. A lot of people see the side of dialectic that's, okay, because Hegel in the tradition of Plato is a philosopher who says you have to look at the whole forest uh, to understand the trees. When he, when he asks what justice is, you have to talk about justice in the state and the whole society before we then get down to talking about individual interactions. So Marx is very, is very much that kind of dialectician. You have to look at the whole, we have to look at capitalism. We have to look at the modern bourgeois state and so forth. At the same time though, Marx is, is not Plato. So he doesn't feel that, every, and, and neither does Hegel, that every, uh, everything has to be collapsed into a single whole. Hegel has this wonderful sentence uh, saying, you know, this is not what we need to do. We don't want to be so uniform in the way that we look at things as a totality, that we have a night in which all cows are black. In other words, if we really go into the barn and it's at night and we don't have a flashlight, all the cows are black. We can't see the white one from the black one from the brown one, whatever. Uh, that's, Hegel denies that's what he's doing and Marx denies what he's, that, that's what he's doing also. So because the universal, uh, the, the, the ancient Greek universal does not particularize itself, but the Marxian and Hegelian universal has to particularize itself. For Hegel himself, the French Revolution in his own time is actually a particularization of the dialectic of, uh, of freedom. Uh, for Marx, you have obviously the proletariat is a particularization of it, but it's not only the proletariat, capital and labor form a dialectical uh, contradiction, but there's these other social forces that both hold back labor from reaching its full class consciousness, as I was mentioning in the case of Ireland, and this also forces uh, within labor like working women or black workers, or even forces outside the proletariat itself, uh, such as demands for uh, civil rights and so on, because the, the civil war was not just a labor issue. It, it, it was political and, and there were a lot of other issues uh, involved there as well. It's talking about the civil war in the United States. So multiple subjects, multiple particularizations of the universal that have to be worked out. There's not a formula uh, by which to do that. And it's a dialectic of both uh, totality, if you will, but also opposition, contradiction, and uh, resistance. Fourthly and finally, uh, I think it's a little bit submerged in the book, but I want to highlight in this discussion, because we're dealing with a fairly sophisticated group of people. I'm sure you all read a lot of other Marxist books beside mine, anti-Stalinism. Now, it's a peculiar kind of anti-Stalinism in my book. I mean, I've written other things about Stalinism. I'm not talking about the Stalinist system as an authoritarian system, except for their occasional, you know, killing off of some of the editors of Marx's works. And I'm not talking about the mechanical materialism and so forth that is often associated with that tradition at a philosophical level, kind of a non-dialectical materialism, if you will, although they use the phrase. Uh, I'm talking about the Stalinists as editors and publishers of Marx. So, Yes, there's a, just a couple examples here. There's a text called Marx's Mathematical Ma Manuscripts that was published finally, I guess, in the 1970s or 80s. In the 1920s, it was already prepared with some assistance that had, had been recommended to them by Einstein in Russia. But since so many of these people were killed off, it just never appeared. And it's not in the collected works of Marx either, those red things. And it'll eventually appear in the Marx Engels Gesamt Ausgabe, but there is an edition of part of it in English, and I think a longer edition in Russian and maybe German. The Grundrisse was delayed by about 20 years. Uh, we fi it finally came out in 1939, an edition that 
almost no one knew about. And then finally, really after World War II, so about 1950, the 1844 manuscripts were published in 18, 1927 in Russia, 1932 in German, but then pushed aside. Like, you can't see it there, but those blue volumes down there that were published, this is the official Marx Engels Werke from Berlin, Ostberlin uh, in the 1950s and 60s. They have like, I guess it's 40 volumes, I think. And then they have the uh, supplementary volume. You know, so after you've gone through all 40, if you're not too tired, maybe look at these. Well, that's where they put the 1844 manuscripts. So even when they publish it, very grudgingly. But what my book deals with is another aspect mainly, which is what they did with these notebooks of Marx. Because these notebooks that I was talking about where Marx writes about indigenous people, women, colonialism, in the last years of his life, 1879 to 82, are... Uh, these were known. Uh, there was a report to the Communist Academy in 1923 where the content, a lot of it was listed, but the decision was made not to publish it, uh, not to include it in, in the collected works. And the comments that are made just reek of Eurocentrism in the sense of, boy, he wasn't doing that much for the end of his life. His mental capacities kind of declined. And uh, he was like dabbling in like, Russian statistics and looking at India and some of this irrelevant stuff instead of finishing up the book Capital. It's literally, that's what, uh, that's what they say. Now, why could the Stalinists not get us out of this problem? Because certainly by the 1950s, they wanted to be very anti-colonialist and that they wanted to uh, appeal to Africa and Asia and Latin America against you know, their competition with the United States. So why couldn't they do it? Because Engels, didn't, going back all the way to Engels, see Engels wrote this book, Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. Engels actually looked at these notebooks, he found certain things, but not, he didn't find the anti-colonialist part. He found the part on gender and he wrote about it. And frankly, it's a little bit mechanical materialist in the way that he writes about it. If you were to publish Marx's notes, you'd open up all these things of like, well, did Engels get it right? Same reason they didn't publish the drafts of Capital, because there's a lot of there's issues there are too. Uh, and the editing of, of Capital Volume One uh, by Engels is a real problem. Not, not just I'm not talking about like volumes two and three. Everybody knows that Engels had Marx's manuscripts and that he put it together, so that's clear. But volume one, he doesn't quite say openly what he's doing enough. And so he takes these two editions that ex existed, one in French, one in German, and he combines them. And he leaves out a couple of the most wonderful sentences dealing with uh, colonialism. Uh, he just doesn't think they're important, as I talk about in the book. So, so the reason the Stalinism comes important here is See, if the Stalinists want to go from Marx to Engels to Lenin, and then in the, you know, in the days of Stalin to Stalin, and later on they drop out Stalin, but still Marx, the Marx-Engels-Lenin Institute and so forth. If you start questioning Engels, the whole thing, I mean, you're in a Catholic country. So if we start saying that a St. Paul misinterpreted, which some say, you know, you really start to mess up the whole, the whole thing. So, so that's what, uh, that's what is involved. Okay, so in general, what did I try to do in this book? At least in the United States and the English speaking world, we have two types of revolutionary radicalism nowadays. We have one that, uh, that centers on race, gen gender, and sexuality, reads people like Michel Foucault. Uh, you find a lot of these people in Black Lives Matter and some of these kinds of movements. And then we have another part of the left that you find in the, the Bernie Sanders campaign, very class oriented. They'll say, you know, uh, what is this stuff like economic inequality, so forth. So what my book was trying to do, because obviously I'm trying to make Marxism more alive to a generation concerned with race and gender but it's, but it's not like I'm saying, I don't, 
say this with a sledgehammer, but I'm kind of implying that the people who talk about race and gender without Marx, that they need Marx. I didn't quite say it. I mean, it's partly because of my positionality. I mean, look at me. It's an old white guy. I can't quite say that openly uh, in the book. And maybe I should, since being recorded, maybe I shouldn't be saying it, but I just did. In other words, there is this suggestion that we need Marx, that you know, all this happens in the context of capitalism. Gender oppression, racial oppression, and resistance operate in the context of capitalism. So what's great about Marx is he tries to do both. He tries to look at race and gender, but also tries to look at capitalism. Thank you. <laughs>